Okay, um, now in this video, we are going to present um, some very key concepts in Geoffrey Chaucer which students find really disturbing. Now, um, the general prologue and the Canterbury Tales, personally, I find it, it is my favorite among all 10 texts. But then some will say that it is challenging and difficult to follow, but I don't understand why that be because. The general prologue and the uh, prologue to the Canterbury Tales in narrative poem set in the medieval period and it gives us an insight of the Brit of British society, not just British society but Europe as a whole. So having gone through the two parts of it, now I did a video on uh, the general prologue and the structure of the of the poem in all two parts. That is the first part being the general prologue introduction to our 29 pilgrims who are en route. To Thomas Abeke's shrine in Canterbury and then we also spoke about um, the merchant's tale about uh, the 60 year old retired knight who goes by the name of uh, January who got married to May the 20 year old uh, young maiden now if you look behind there uh, about what do you see you, you observe that there are some key items on the board that I want to I want to discuss on beginning with setting now setting in Geoffrey Chaucer has always been a problem area for candidates I don't know why that is but since I've always seen setting as a problem area but it is not as problematic as I think it is now take note that in literature setting has traditionally been defined as uh, uh, space geographical space and time now geographical space has to do with the physical location where you see action rolling now Time has to do with the season. It could be the hour, the period of the day. Is it morning, afternoon, evening? Is it in the night? Uh, is it in the 19th century? Is it during winter? Is it during summer, autumn? But then one thing that examiners look out for is how mature candidates are to tie up setting with the events of the story. Now, take note that it is all about oneness and unity. There has to be wholesome. How do setting work together with the events? Because authors don't pick out setting for the sake of picking them out. They, they look out for the best setting that can host that event in order to acquire credibility and authenticity now remember being real as much as possible is a watch word so when the story lacks that possibility it is it is, it is obviously too fictional and if, if it is too fictional you can't believe what it is but then a story is all about make believe how do you narrate stories and make them as real as possible let them be a direct enactment of real life activities so when we look at uh, your picture the general prologue Chosa has achieved that quite a lot at the level of setting so let us look up here now we have two settings space and time space there is place or geographical location i will observe that our pilgrimage begins at Southwark. It is set in Southwark, London, and at the Tabat Inn. Now, that is a physical location where our 29 pilgrims gather. But the question is this why choose the Tabat Inn of all places? Now, that is where the effectiveness is coming from, and that is where the marks are. Now, the reason is simple Southwark, London, and Tabat Inn as a physical setting initiates the dual, the duality or, 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 or the two dimensions of uh, the double dimensions of the journey. These pilgrims tell us that they are going out for a pilgrimage, but then when we look at the area where they decide to take lodgings before embarking on the journey, it leaves us with little to be desired. There's quite a lot that comes up our minds because we know that for a holy journey, we need to pray. We need to pray when we embark on a holy journey. We need to pray. Of course, we need to pray. We need to fast. And we need to sing songs and meditate too. You see, those are the things we must do when we embark on the holy journey. But then, here is the thing. When our pilgrims decide to lodge in one of the best resource centers at the time, in the place of Southwark, London, then it lets it makes we tend to realize that they were not just out there for a holy journey. Of course, they're going out there to enjoy themselves. Just a minute, let me see what's happening. Okay, my, my light went off, so I thought I'll switch it on back. So, Southwark. London, Tabat Inn. Tabat Inn in particular was a known, was 
one of the best resource centers. It was a known physical. Uh, 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 it was one of the best inns at the time where the rich would lodge in. Now, for our pilgrims to decide to go to a Tabat Inn, and coupled with that, the owner tells us that there's good wine, there's good food, and there are large enough rooms for everyone. That tells us that it was all about pleasure. There wasn't any real spiritual activity going on. But then these guys are embarking on a spiritual journey. So, how come? So that tells us that they were not just out there, there was also a, ple a pleasure motive too that motivated the journey, hence the effectiveness of the Tabat Inn as a physical location where our 29 pilgrims will launch before they embark on the journey. Now, secondly, we also have um, the pilgrimage. Now, the pilgrimage itself can pass for a certain because take note that details are recounted en route to Canterbury. They were on this pilgrimage, they were on horseback when they embarked on this, uh, uh, when they carried out this uh, pilgrimage. Of course, there were no vehicles, so horses were their mode of transport at the time. And so for them to, to ride on horseback, they had to tell stories in order to keep the journey in, interesting and entertaining. More or less, again, the pleasure motif for the journey. And so that pilgrimage can serve too like a setting because it is a motif. It's a motif through which the stories are revealed like the merchant's tale. Now, close to the play, uh, physical setting is the time. Now, at what time did the journey take place? Now, we are told that the journey took place in the month of April and May. Chosa records it in the first or the opening part, uh, uh, part of the play, the opening uh, of the play. When Chosa tells us that when the showers of April has pierced the droughts of March and the young sun, the ram, has gone half its corpse, then birds were chirping. And when the showers of April has pierced down the droughts of March, providing life-giving moisture to plants, the plants will blossom, causing birds to chirp. So this, this, this uh, uh, freshness and rebirth and level of nature, vegetation is lush, it is fresh. And so this rejuvenation, people thought that it is only normal for them to extend this rebirth to their spiritual lives. They should whip up their spiritual life, they, sh they should rebuild their spiritual life. Hence, the most appropriate time for this journey is the month of April and May. That is why we did say that the month of May is a motif. Motif means that a recurring structure in literature that keeps coming up again and again and again and again with a hidden message in it. In this case, May. May has a symbolic uh, uh, meaning in the poem, so it becomes a motif. So that is the, the, the time setting. So you can clearly see uh, the time there is May and it signals rebirth at the level of nature. That's why we, we could see birds and plants chirping and celebrating nature. So at 29 pregames, that is man decides to, to rebuild his spiritual life, hence the spiritual journey, which is a pilgrimage to Canterbury. Of course, they are en route to the, the shrine of Thomas R. Beckett. Chosa calls him the blissful or the happy martyr. Now we come down to the medieval church. Candidates sometimes are perplexed when it comes to Chosa's portrait of the medieval church. But then one thing I'll tell you is that Chosa will not come out openly and tell you, ah, hey, hey, I'm writing about the medieval church, no. But then he does present the medieval church using what we call the church officers, the clergy. Now, take note that Geoffrey Chaucer's the general prologue is what we call estate literature. Estate literature is literature that that presents uh, uh, social classes. Any, any piece of literature that presents the different uh, 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 levels of our society, the upper and the lower classes, we call that estate literature. So Chaucer's the general prologue can clearly be analyzed as estate literature because it presents three class of people. The first is the nobility. Now, nobility is at, at, at the bourgeoisie, it's those whose hands para dates. And so to come from the noble class means that the, you belong to those that hold power. And in Jovichosa 29 pilgrims, the knight is a man of war. And by conventions of the time, you can only become a knight if you come from a wealthy background, that means that the knight is a wealthy man who presents nobility. And if from nobility, therefore his son, the squire too, is from nobi is, is a noble, is a member of the noble class. So the three of them, including the young man, can be treated as nobility. That's the first class. The second class then is the clergy. The clergy are the church officers, those who represent the medieval church. Clearly on the board, you can see there, we have the church officers, we have priorists, we have the monk, we have the poor person and the plowman. These are church officers who presented the church. So through them, Chosa gives us his stake on the medieval church, the institution of the medieval church. The examiner might still challenge you by asking you to discuss Chosa's portrait of any three institutions of your choice. One of them is the medieval church. So, our question is, 
What was Chosa's attitude towards the medieval church? Chosa has a mixed attitude towards the medieval church. Oh, yes. Candace are at times tempted to say that Chosa was just all uh, um, uh, frustrated with the medieval church. Oh, yes, he was frustrated. But the portrait of the poor person and the plowman are quite positive, which means that not every church officer was corrupt. So that strikes a balance at the level of his attitude towards the medieval church. So examiners, of course, will be looking out for candidates who have a critical mindset in responding to Chosa's portrait of the medieval church. So when we talk about the medieval church, the first thing we do know is that the medieval church was a deeply corrupt and materialistic institution whose church, whose officers, most of them were, ende they were so corrupt. So corruption was an endemic part of the medieval church. It was so materialistic and so wealthy. Chaucer captures the medieval church that had amassed so much wealth to itself at the detriment, at the expense of its own parishioners. While the parishioners were so impoverished, the church officers had amassed quite a lot of material things for themselves. A case in point is a prowess. Now we are told that this woman is very, very rich and giving her position again as a church leader. She's a church leader, even though the position is not uh, 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 outrightly spelled. But when we are told that she comes into Tabat Inn with a secretary followed by some priest behind behind us then we can say that she's more like a mother superior in the convent or in the nunnery now take note that a prioress means a nun what we call in local palams a reverend sister and so this woman is very very sophisticated and her sophistication is a reflection of the church she represents why do we say she's sophisticated the things that she loves doing the nickname she has taken for herself england time the way she dresses and presents herself the things she keep like pets and the jewelry she wear, all of these tells us of her sophistication. Now this woman is so obsessed with worldly life that she will do everything it will take just so that she can be well endowed with courtly manners. Take note of Chosa's vivid details on how she handles her cutlery, how she drinks from a cup without leaving any trace of grease at the edges of the cup, how she is able to pull her veil, exposing her forehead, which is contrary to preachings of the Bible. Now, take note of her soft red lips, which of course are symbols of uh, attraction and seduction. Now, we also take note of her pleated and styled gown, which is worldly. We should also note, uh, note her obsession with French, a language that was meant for the rich and powerful at the time. French was a language for the nobility. But then, given that she's a reverend sister who should be married to church, and her watchword has to be humility, instead, she's so obsessed and will speak French, but Chusa makes a mockery of her. When Chusa laughs at her, that she tries to speak French, Parisian French, even though she has the Brad Bradford accent. <laughs> That's quite laughable though. So take note of humor again as a vehicle for criticism, social satire. So that is a, 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 the prowess. Now she picks up a name Englantine. Englantine means a beautiful flower that grows in the wild. Now that name really fits her. It tells us that she's at the wrong place. She's a worldly woman who shouldn't be in the convent. Because the things she loves doing are not those that we identify with a nun or a reverend sister. So she's at the wrong place. That is why she go for such a wild name that reflects her wild ways. Now, she also keeps pets. Now, we are talking about misplaced affection and charity. Now, as a woman who presents a church, we are expecting her to, 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 to go out there, preach to the poor, the lepers, uh, uh, those that are hungry, and all of that. But then, instead, she decides to keep pets. She keeps pets, cats. And she feeds them with fine bread. Chosa says fine bread and, and flesh, which is metaphor for meat. Now, if this woman feeds her pets with fine bread and meat, it tells us of one thing, that she is very rich and powerful. Because you will not be using fine bread, bread of the best quality to feed pets. And worst of all, if somebody should hit it with a stick, this woman will cry. So why would you pour out such affections on animals where there are people who need, those affe need that affection? It tells us that she's such an... Uh, 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 she's a hypocrite. I'll face it that way. She's a hypocrite. Oh, yes. She's a hypocrite and she's guilty of misplaced affection and charity. So we see Chosa's uh, anti feministic stance towards her. Chosa, an anti feminist or a misogynist, castigating her and, of course, extended criticism on the medieval church. Now, close to her is a monk, another corrupt church officer. Now, this man, this man should embrace monastic life, but then. 
he hates it. He detests monastic life so much. He sees it as old and outmoded. He wouldn't spend his time reading books, meditating, because those things are outmoded, like St. Benedict. No. Rather, he would rather go for an outdoor activity like hunting, which of course was identified with the rich. That is what he loves doing. And that is not all. What makes it even worse is that he loves so he likes noise so much that he would fasten bells at the feet of his horses. When he's riding, the bells will ring as loud as those of a chapel. That is just how odd this fellow is. And Chusa describes him as a fish out of water, which means that he's always in the wrong place. He loves hunting and he keeps dogs too. Chusa calls him uh, hounds, which he uses for hunting. Physically, he's fresh, bald head, shiny like a glass with eyes like those of a small pig. That tells us that he's well fed which is contrary to what we expect. Because as a monk, he should be involved in a life of prayer, fasting, and meditation, which should, of course, leave him is, you know, smaller in physique. But then this man is plump, huge, looking fresh, which means he's well-fed. What an opposite. Then, that is where Chusa used, that's how Chusa comes out hard on the church. And on the positive side, the poor person and the plowman are two of Chusa's idealized characters. Chusa loves them because they keep the work of Christ going. Remember what Christ told Peter, will you take off my flock? Now these two are doing exactly that. The plowman will help the mothers in the village to tie up their fences, to plow and dig up dung, and then preach to them and listen to confessions. His brother on the other side, the poor person, like the name go the poor person, person means a priest. He's poor means that he's not materialistic. And little money he has, he would give it out to charity to the poor villagers. No matter how far the houses are apart, he would still move from one house to the other, preaching to them. Whether it rains or there's there is baking sun out there, he would do his job. So he was truly the shepherd that Christ had ordained him to be. So two of them, uh, they present a glimmer of hope for the medieval church. That is why we earlier said, Chosa's portrait of the church is a mixed one. Now, we come down to reflections of the period. When we talk about reflections, what are those reflections of the medieval period that are presented or captured in Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales? The first of them is pilgrimages. Pilgrimages were very common at the time because we are told that Thomas R. Beckett, Thomas R. Beckett, was the slain or the killed martyr. The martyr was killed in the 11th century to whose grave or shrine our pilgrims are embarking on. And Chaucer tells us that people from all England undertake this journey every year to pray, to pray and ask the blissful martyr to intercede on their behalf. It means that pilgrimages were more or less a common a, a, a commonplace phenomenon at the time. We are also told that pilgrims like the wife of Bath has been on several pilgrimages, which means that it was not it was not a new thing. It was something very common at the time. So it's a reflection of that period too. A case in point is it pilgrim that is the pilgrimage that at his night pilgrims are embarked on. Now the next thing there is picnic. What are picnics? Picnics is entertainment when people go out there for you know, for sightseeing, to eat out, for, for, for leisure, we call that picnic. Where do we see, see it in the text? Now, we see it in the merchant tale when we are told that uh, the elderly knight, January, has built a garden where he intends to consume love with his lovely wife, May. That garden there is lush, green, with fruit trees in it. For them to go out there and spend some time at the garden is a reflection of that period. It is a picnic. So we see that we don't only limit our analysis to general prologue, but we must cut through to the merchant still too. So uh, 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 the garden constructed by January is an aspect of uh, the medieval period reflected on it, which we call picnic. Now we go back to the text that we studied, that was studied last year, that is a Franklin tale. We observe that Dorigan's friends too will also take her out for sightseeing for a picnic where they would eat and they would dance and they enjoy the gardens and the seaside. It was in one of such outings that she encountered the hands Rich Aurelius, who was a squire at the time. So you see that in both the Franklin state and the Merchant state, there is uh, an expression of picnics. Now we go down to walls. Walls. Now when we talk about war, we are making reference to the 100 years walls that were very common at the time, the medieval period. Now these 100 years walls, we are talking about religious campaigns between Christians and uh, the Muslims. 
uh, towards the Ottoman Empire, going towards Israel and Jerusalem. There was a huge war fighting for holy ground, and so Europe was dragged into that war. And so because of that, there was quite a lot of insecurity in Europe, and people tend to cluster around churches as a means of uh, 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 securing themselves. People wanted that sense of security, so they had to cluster in churches. That is why the church had wielded so much power in the medieval period. Another example is why our pilgrims have come together as a group. There are 29 of them. They could have still gone there individually. But why have they come together as a group? It's a reflection of the fear and insecurity that marked that period in Europe's history, the presence of wars. Then we go to call it love. What do we see call it love? Call it love then was a concept that was developed across Europe. It originated in France. Now, calling love is a concept where a man would love a woman and would raise that woman to the pedestal of a goddess. He would virtually obsess and worship that woman as a goddess. That is what that's what love was at the time. Love was interpreted more like some kind of a job where a man would sing songs, he would dress, he would write love letters, he would learn how to play musical instruments. Everything he does was oriented towards serving and satisfying his lady. That concept was very common at the time in Europe. So it was known as courtly love. Now, in the general prologue, it is well expressed in the squire's still when we are told that this boy has not been able to sleep and he has gone so pale like a nightingale. He plays the flute, a musical instrument. He writes songs. He has dropped his head to the back and built a very athletic, good athletic body. He wears his short gown with embroidery at the neck area. The hands have the hands uh, uh, have the sleeves have uh, breeches. All of this physical uh, uh, attraction is just to please his lady. So through him, the, the concept of courtly love is well developed. We also see an expression of it in uh, the Prowess's portrait when she wears a brook. A, a, a golden a trinket on a wrist written on it, love conquers all, which is a loose translation from the Italian word amor vincit omnia. That again is under expression of the concept of godly love. Next, we then go down to superstition. Now, sometimes we can talk about superstition, we can also talk about necromancy. All of these were reflections of that period. People didn't just believe in God Almighty, but then people had the belief in pagan gods, the Greek gods, they were very common at the time. People would go to magicians, to philosophers, spells were cast left and right. All of that atmosphere was quite dreary and murky. There was that suspicion and superstitious environment that had shrouded everywhere, the presence of spirits. That same environment is very much presented in the merchant's tale. Now, we did not we did hear about Pluto and the wife Proserpina who appeared in January's garden. Why uh, 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 January was at it with the wife May. May had tricked January to bend over so that he she can step on her back and pluck a pebble. Then that was a ploy. That was just a motive to get her up the tree where she would cheat on him with a uh, Damian who had already climbed on top of the tree waiting for her. And so for Pluto and Proserpina, the two god gods to appear there and then give their take on the concept, be, uh, give their take on uh, the gender struggle between a uh, man and woman represented by me and the husband january it is also a reflection of superstition at the time even gods were were involved in the lives of men so it's a reflection of superstition which was a prevalent concept or a prevalent phenomenon in that period in british history so again we have looked at some of the reflections of the medieval period in Jovichosa, the general prologue and the canterbury thing there they are four of them a question like this examiner is likely going to give you two times four plus two equals to ten which therefore means that the examiner will be expecting you to raise at least four well illustrated aspects of medieval life reflected in, in the job of as a general prologue and again like i said always ensure that you cut across your arguments will come from the general prologue and the merchant state so that you strike a balance now we go down to feminism or women what is closer's attitude towards women and feminism? I remember a student posted a question on that. Now, the first thing that we need to know to take down a question like this is first and foremost to identify the women presented in both parts of the poem. Now, in the general prologue, we have um, uh, the prioress who goes by the name of Madame Englantine. We have the wife of Bath. And on the other side, the flip side, that's the merchant's tale, we have May, the young woman who gets married to a. Uh, 
uh, a jewelry, the 60 year old retired knight. Now, let's begin with the general prologue. Now, Chosa's portrait of women is quite a damning one. Oh, yes, it's quite a damning one. Chosa is an anti feminist par excellence. He leaves no stone unturned when it comes to condemning and castigating women. How did he achieve this? He started by presenting to us their physical endowment, physical attributes, and the things they love doing, which is mostly in contrast to their, 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 their professions. Two, Chosa just doesn't and they come down to their physical features, which is most often reflections of prostitution and deceit. That, is, that doesn't just end there. Chosa goes down to their individual habits to lambast and castigate them. Let's start with Englantai. Now, Englantai is a professed nun, a prioress, whose first duty is that she's married to the church. But then she cheats. She cheats and she does very little to satisfy that religious vow. Everything of hers is in relation to the out, out, outer world, not the church. That is why we say Chosa castigate her. So in her portrait, we see a lot of worldliness in her portrait. We see a lot of religious hypocrisy in her portrait. And we see a lot of misplaced charity in her portrait. That is why we say Chosa is an anti-feminist. All you need to do is to go back to her portrait and pick out all those items that I've just enumerated there and use them to show how Joffrey Chosa uh, criticized her hands. He, he, he condemns women. Now we go down to the wife of Bath. Now the wife of Bath is presented as uh, she's a dressmaker by profession. She first she's very rich and sophisticated. We can identify that from the clothes she wears on her body and her head scarf that weighs as much as ten pounds. Now Chosa comes down to her physical attributes. She has a little space in the upper row of her mouth. We usually say gap tooth. Now, she's, she also has large hips which she balances on the horse. Now, the gap tooth and her large hips tells us that she's highly sexualized. A woman who is obsessed with sex and men. Again, that is a turn of something that Chosa would split her head over. Three, Chosa then goes on to her personal attitude again to tell us that this woman is a champion when it comes to love problems. She has solutions to every love issue on earth. And she's a champion for women empowerment. As she preaches, she campaigns that women must have authority over their men. Even from the tale she narrated about the knight who raped the young maiden and was made to go around the countryside and find out the one thing that women love the most. But then, hopefully, for fortunately for him, he returned with the, with the answer to that riddle that women love to have authority over their men. For her to tell a tale pitched on women's authority, tell us that she too is a symbol of feminism. She strikes for gender parity with the men. She defends the rights of women. But then Chosa still condemns her for being a flirt, given that she'll be married five times in church. Not to count the numerous, numerous boyfriends she used to have while she was young. Now the next woman that we see there again is May. Moving over to the merchant still. She's a married woman, but then she cheats with a younger man. That tells us that she married January not for love, but probably for material things. That's why she begins to cheat on him. Two, she's so full of deceit. She deceives him in all ways. First, deceives him and she makes correspondences with Damian, a boy who works for the husband. Secondly, she deceives him and duplicates the key to a special garden that symbolizes her marriage and love with her husband. Third, she deceives him, steps on his back and makes love with Damian on a tree. It tells us that this woman's middle name is Deceit. Oh yes, let's put it like that. She's so deceptive and manipulative. She used her feminine charm to manipulate him. And at the end of the day, she lies her way out of it. And she keeps the room open for further for further episodes of uh, for further uh, uh, opportunities for her to cheat. So all of that tells us that Chosa takes women to task for things like deception, prostitution, or debauchery, if you will, manipulation, lies, materialism, hypocrisy, misplaced charity and love, or affection. Therefore, Chosa is an anti-feminist. So that is that. I thought that I should quickly do a rundown of this. Of this, it's, it's a very simple point. Once you can study the 
you can study the uh, 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 the the merchant still is a very short poem about the marriage between January and May, and then you go back and look at the major highlights of all our twenty nine pilgrims. You'll be able to handle equation without any stress in general the general prologue. So that is that. In our next video, we are going to go down to something that we've not done before, and then see what we can do. So I hope to see you again in our next video.